It's the, uh... Hello, dear, how are you? <laughs> Told you never to come where I'm working, you know that. <laughs> Somebody said backstage, Peter said, it sounds like a wild group. Oh, yeah, tonight. they're ready. This is, uh... This is Friday the 13th, as you know. And... Uh... <laughs> And if you didn't think you were going to have any bad luck, you were wrong. Here comes the monologue. <laughs> uh, personally, I'm not, uh, I'm not superstitious at all. No? It doesn't bother me. I would not walk under me during the monologue, though. That's uh, superstition. Well, you're superstitious. Yes. You never crawl under a ladder. No, never. I mean, you would... Uh... You... The reception wore you out, didn't it? You have nothing left. Well, I hope you all had a very happy, lucky Friday the 13th. I mean, with the way things is going this past year, what else could go wrong <laughs> on Friday the 13th anyway? Where's Tom? Tom's superstitious. Tommy Newsom. Yeah? He licks him to a mirror the mirror, gets seven years bad luck. <laughs> you know that? What have you got on your chest? What My is... Friday the 13th outfit right here. You know, it's better than walking under a ladder. <laughs> no, not exactly. That's a, what is that, a knit? Uh... Yes. It's, uh, I crochet. knit it myself. What? It's crochet. I'm going to be a cheerleader and orgy later on. <laughs> <laughs> when you say go, gang, go, you mean it, right? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh. What else could I say? Anyway, it's, uh, it's pretty, it wasn't bad today. The smoggy. Lovely day. Smoggy, smoggy. Smoggy yesterday. Yes, lovely today. Light smog today. <laughs> How, you know, um, how light and smug he was. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get you into it, you see. <laughs> Your brain is gone. <laughs> no, yesterday was really smoggy, though. Oh, yes? Yeah, they had a parachutist jump out over Los Angeles, and he fractured his skull on the sky. Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> All the way to get there for nothing. <laughs> well, let's, let's find out what's in the news. Uh, as you know, the, the Senate is investigating... Um, Vice President to be, I suppose he will be confirmed, Nelson Rockefeller. And everybody is wondering how much money Nelson Rockefeller has. And they came out today in the paper and said that his immediate personal fortune, this is Mr. Rockefeller talking, was $33 million. That was his personal, now what he meant by that is immediate fortune. That's all he had on him. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> So they're asking, they don't think that's quite accurate because according to the Senate, they think it's more like $300 million that he should be worth. And Rockefeller says he did have $300 million, uh, dollars, but his wife went shopping for food last weekend. <laughs> Whoa. I need this crowd like Kojak needs head and shoulders. <laughs> I had that one in there a long time ago. It's, it's never used it. Uh, don't ever throw anything away. You never know when you're going to go on the ground. Uh, if you've been watching the news, the local news, the Los Angeles, I guess it's the uh, municipal council that have been listening for months and months. Los Angeles City, we're 193 years old, does not have an official city song. Did you know that? Oh, oh that's what I say. San Francisco has I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Chicago has what? Chicago, my kind of Chicago, town. My Chicago. kind of town plus Chicago. What's Kansas City? I know Kansas City has one. Yeah, I'm going to Kansas City. Is that it? Sure. <laughs> How about Memphis? Um, Memphis Blues. Memphis Blues. Memphis Blues. Yes. They narrowed it down to the, uh, the ten semifinalist songs. What are they? Well, one of them was Sam Yorty, Won't You Please Come Home. They thought that would be nice. <laughs> On a clear day you can't see forever is still in the morning. <laughs> um... <laughs> Show me the way to Forest Lawn is in the uh, <laughs> looking like the biggie, but they don't have any, do they? Really? No, that uh, isn't there. They a, have a couple of LA songs. What LA break one? down and take me in. What? LA break down and take me in. <laughs> that's that's a song. Yes. Are Jack you, Jones had a hit on that. LA break down. And take me in. I don't know. I'm so lost and on my own again. I think you're putting me on. No, there's a real song. How many people know? You know it, Jack Jones. I don't know. Oh, right. But it's not an official 
Wait, well, they're City looking song. for it. That's a suggestion. Well, Joe William has a song about L.A. Who? Joe Williams, the singer. Well, what is it called? It's called uh, Just a Little Spot of Ground. <laughs> what the hell is this? Name that tune? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Wayne Bailey! <laughs> well, now let's see what else has been happening. We'll get back to that. No, we won't, because we've got nowhere with it anyway. <laughs> we got no, to see you, you run. Right. back to the scene of the murder, do you, or the tragedy? <laughs> uh, would you like to hear some interesting news from Japan? Oh, yes. Oh, oh where we, we're talking about that at lunch. About what at lunch? About some news from Japan? Yeah, that's right, we were. I'll help you any way you I can. You lied. <laughs> they just had a big police crackdown. They had a gangster. They rounded up 6,000 gangsters. Six thousand. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might have missed one. <laughs> Oh, but you know they have a Japanese mafia over there, yeah. led by Sessua Corleone. <laughs> yeah. That's right, Sessua Corleone. The, the kiss of death is a little different over there. They plant a hickey on your chopstick. They don't actually give you a kiss of death. No, if you don't make up your payments and not loan, two guys come over and break the antenna off your Sony. This is strange. <laughs> That's what they do. They break the antenna off your Sony. Do you know there's capital punishment in Japan? But no electric chair. If you're guilty of murder, they make you sit on a hibachi. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, we've got a good show tonight. We have uh, Joe and Emery from the San Diego Zoo with some, some animals tonight. What do we have? Anything dangerous? <laughs> no man-eating snakes or any of that jazz tonight. Yeah, one, maybe a snake. One? Oh, we'll find out. I never know, really. I saw some strange beast back there. It was one of the stagehands. <laughs> we have uh, David Brenner is here tonight. We have Ashley Montague. <laughs> and Lawrence Welk is with us, and he, uh, he had a bad experience today. A uh, crazed musician forced him into a sauna and unpleated his accordion. <laughs> <laughs> Guy was deranged, obviously, so you, <laughs> you sound in a good mood, and you're certainly in a good mood. Yes, sir. So we're going to be with you in just one minute. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back. Oh. Okay. It's so nice to have you around here on a Friday. What do you mean? You used to be taking an awful lot of Fridays off, and... Friday's a particularly great day for me. It is. I love Friday. It's the end of the week, beginning of the weekend, let it get rolling, you can relax, have a drink if you tend to do that. Uh, what, 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 uh, possible reason that you would not have, you mean you don't drink on not Tuesday through Thursday? Oh, no, no, until work is over. Oh, oh, then one oh, 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 it's, work is over. it's me, balloon face. We've been together, Moose Jaw, for a long time. Don't sit here and look at Moose Jaw. I don't know. Don't sit and try oh, to tell me that you oh, don't have a little... No, but the weekends, you can relax a little more. You have a nice couple of jars any time you, you want to. Around here on a Friday night, it's very yeah. nice. Well, audiences get wacky on Friday. Yeah. I think everybody's glad that the work week is over, yeah. and they're... <laughs> now, you know, if we mentioned Friday the 13th, and I mentioned this the other night on the air. It's a phobia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called triskaidekaphobia, which is an unnatural fear of the number 13. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from, do you know? Greek? Um, Greek mythology? Did it have anything to do with the... Wouldn't have anything to do with the disciples, would it? No. Uh, twelve, twelve. I mean, there were only twelve disciples. Well, I thought if they were going to add one once. Uh, oh. I, I didn't know. <laughs> he went us unlucky was not a... No, I don't think so. Then. Where did... It would be hard to sell. Anybody know in the audience? Yeah, Greek restaurant on 23rd Street. <laughs> a Greek restaurant on... What? what? We're trying to figure out why the uh, 13 became an unlucky number. We should have researched that. We look like yeah. a couple... Excuse me? You were married that day. <laughs> so was I. Mm. 
I don't Very care. unlucky number. <laughs> but the extent they go, they don't have 13th floors and buildings. And I know hotels. that. We should have researched that. We yeah. can't come on here and act like two klutzes. We're supposed to know things like that. Anyway, that's triskaidekaphobia. Now, here's some, you know, claustrophobia, of course. Yes. Fear of closed places. Hydrophobia, fear, fear of water. water. Acrophobia, fear, fear of high of places. Pyrophobia is a fear of fire. Right. Now, here's some lesser known ones, but these are real. Pornophobia is a fear of prostitutes. It is. Pornophobia. Pornophobia. Conistrophobia is a fear of slovenly places. Conistrophobia. Oh. Would you know what dysmorphophobia is? Something about death. fear. No, fear of being misshapen. <laughs> Dysmorphophobia. Uh, erythrophobia is a fear of blushing. E R Y T H R O. Phobia, a fear of blushing. There is a fear of dentists, believe it or not. Mm, People who have an unnatural that. fear, all right. Odontiatrophobia. Yes. Odontiatrophobia. Uh, acomophobia. No, uh, there's a P in there. How would you say that? A C O M A P. Acomophobia. Fear of short hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, these are real. These are out of, uh, out of a book. Geniophobia. Geniophobia is a fear of chins. <laughs> but that. Some of these are P E D A L O T R O. What? Pedatolotrophobia? Would that be right? Yeah. Pedalotrophobia. Fear of children. Fear of people who worship children. Are those weird? Strange. Those are strange, but those are real. Those but are real. Those aren't all of them. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those I are not sure that you'd covered every phobia there was. Those are unusual. Yes. We researched some really strange. Do you think those are bizarre? These are really weird. Here's some weird ones. Uh, Aedophobia. What Aedophobia. Is, what is that? That's the fear of a stranger helping you get dressed. <laughs> Aedophobia. <laughs> when you have that, you're right on the borderline. Oh, yeah, oh yes. So. Uh, make out a phobia. <laughs> it's the fear of brassiere hooks. <laughs> An unnatural fear. Again. Right. Tubophobia. It's a fear of a hospital nurse telling you to roll over. <laughs> Retrophobia. Retrophobia. That's the fear of waking up on the floor next to an empty gallon of Madria Madria Sangria. <laughs> I told you these are weird. Weird, weird. Genesophobia. What is that? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's the fear of having moss grow in your pants. <laughs> Nominophobia. Yes. Little known, but certainly one of the stranger Weird. ones. The fear of someone running up to you and calling you Al. <laughs> <laughs> Nominophobia. Nominophobia. <laughs> Yuckophobia. <laughs> is the fear of Carl Malden asking to borrow your handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> Elvisophobia is the fear of your zipper getting caught in an electric guitar. It's not for long. Narcophobia is the fear of opening a pay toilet and seeing no paper. <laughs> and Fordophobia is the fear of the word pardon. <laughs> Did you know that? That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh. Okay, enough nonsense. <laughs> uh, we have on the show tonight, in just a moment, Joan Embry from the San Diego Zoo will be with us with some assortment of beasts yes. and creatures, uh, fish and fowl, right. uh, no fish, I don't think. Uh, David Brenner, Ashley Montague, and Mr. Lawrence Welk are all here tonight. We'll be back right after this short intermission. Stay with us. Good to keep private for ourselves. Pat McCormick, just walk over and give me another phobia. Radial phobia. Radial phobia. It's what? a fear of waking up in a Memphis motel room with a snow tire. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't ask. One of our, <laughs> one, our favorite guest is Joan Embry, who works for the San Diego Zoo as an animal handler and trainer. And uh, 
These are always great spots because uh, they go to a lot of trouble in San Diego Zoo. They send, which is what, a good three hour trip from here? Yeah. Send all these animals up here and they're fascinating. Would you welcome Miss Joan Embry? Easy there. Yeah. Easy. Whoa, whoa, boy. Whoa, girl. Whoa, girl. Whatever. Girl. girl. <laughs> this is Belkina. Belkina? Our Mongolian wild horse. Przewalski wild horse. A what? Przewalski. Przewalski wild horse. Wild horse. This is a horse. This is a horse. It's the ancestor to all of our domestic forms, all of the various breeds we have today. I didn't know that. And they're thought to be extinct in the wild. The, la the last sighting was about 1967. Did this come from Mongolia, or did you breed this one in? No, the... I mean, not you personally, but I mean... You... <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. This, this was bred at our wild animal park. And there are about 200 in captivity, and they were all bred from the imported stock in the 1900s. They don't kick, do they? John? Yeah. <laughs> huh? She kicks a little, but if you don't bother her... Is this full grown now? Full grown? No, this is a baby. baby? It's a baby. She's only uh, about... Two months old. Do they get oh. bigger than this? She's about 14 hands and a hand's four inches. So at the oh, winter's about. Oh, I thought about this was it. Oh no, she's just two months. Oh, she's just I a didn't baby. Know that. I thought it was a full-grown horse. No, they're they're fairly good size. They're very stocky. It'd be great for a dwarf dude ranch, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> at this age. Come on. This age. She's just learning how to work on a halter. She says. Oh, I see. see she's just learning to walk. There you go on a halter. Now, are these she's the, doing pretty good. Did they ride these or domesticate them at all? Or are they pretty much? They have never been trained uh, by anyone. Uh, really okay. In fact, I don't know that they're, they've been halter broken anywhere. What do they call a Przewalski's horse or what is it? Przewalski. Przewalski. Or Mongolian wild horse. And, uh, you know, if it weren't for zoos, we really wouldn't have any. They would be extinct because that's the only place they have been. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, boy, one more. <laughs> he's cute. Good. She'll take at least another year before she's full grown, right. year and a half. All right, you have to really train this one, don't you? Well, it takes a little bit of training to get her to walk out here because she's more like a wild animal than a domestic horse. She's doing pretty well. Notice okay. they have their main stems straight up, right. and they don't have a forelock like a horse. Okay, what's her name? Her name's Belkina. Belkina. They're all named right. all according to this. They have recorded in their stud book. All of the names are according to the female's first two letters in her name. You're just so, jealous because you're not in the stud book. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Belkina. Always jealous of him. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm always afraid to get behind a horse or in front of a horse. <laughs> I never get under a horse. No. Especially a sick horse. <laughs> Some of those cartoons when the animals stop, you know, put on the brake. <laughs> now, right here on our stage, here for our next animal. Oh, you see, everybody always does that, right? This what? is Nicole. Hey. <laughs> what is it? It's a baby guanaco. A baby guanaco. <laughs> The hell is a guanaco? <laughs> you ever heard of a guanaco? Oh. Come on. That face looks like one of the rich puppets. You know that face? <laughs> They're a member of the cameloid family. Oh, oh. Uh, that, that's what you want, right? The same family of the yamas and the hmm? alpacas. You want some of this? That's good. <laughs> Nicole is one month old. Where is Nicole she's from? She's from South America. Okay. I guess she's probably not hungry, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're cute. They're not... just this is just a baby, there. right? Just a baby. They weigh about 150 pounds and they're full grown. She'll stand about four and a half feet tall. She, she's, she's cute. Yes, she's a good girl. She's affectionate, isn't she? Now, this is born this in is captivity? Very friendly. Born in the San Diego Zoo, this okay, one. Okay, okay. And okay. raised in our nursery. <laughs> okay, 
Okay. We got a crazed guanaco in our hands. <laughs> Nothing worse than a de deranged guanaco. She can jump about five feet. She okay, really well, uh, jumps I'd better well. take her Just... off. <laughs> okay. No hard feelings. <laughs> Friendly. Oh. We'll return in a moment, right after this, with more animals, right here. All quiet. Look at that. Where's Joan? Is she getting a... Will you look at something else before we look at these? Oh, we'll, there she is. We'll go over here. Ooh! Ooh. Have you seen these before? <laughs> oh, yeah. Didn't we, we have these we cheetahs? We had these cheetahs when they weighed about, oh, two pounds, look at, look and we're just babies. We had three. Ooh. These are two males, and unfortunately, our female was stolen from our wild animal park. Really? Now, why, very somebody, sad why on earth would somebody? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're bluffing really more than anything. They, a great they're a little white bit excited. hunter, I'm not, you know. Here comes the rhinoceros, Miss Wilson. Where? <laughs> that just goes to show you that even though they're hand raised and handle a lot every day, that they do have wild instincts, and you can see that this comes through when they become excited. Absolutely. You know, they're very good. Uh, I remember holding one of those on the show. We'll see what one will do. Uh, we, we oh, held no, you don't have to get them, them out. No, really. <laughs> no, not if they're, they're comfortable. Don't do that. <laughs> hey, don't get them out. Don't, really. I mean, you know. Simba, Simba. That's for a lion, isn't it? Okay, it didn't do anything. This one, you'll notice already the different personalities. See how one is quieted down and the other one's yes. more aggressive. They, you, they can do you have speak to them some way? Like, okay. They're speaking to you right now. Just relax. They, they purr. Relax. And they say if you look an animal right in the face and talk to them, you, you say, then they know you're not scared. Oh. <laughs> doesn't like you. We'll put the top back on. <coughs> put the lid on the cheetah. Put the lid on. <laughs> Damn lucky he's in there. I'd tear him apart. <laughs> Notice how I cowed him right off? That'll teach you. We, we brought them back because they are going back. Well, don't bring them back again. Because <laughs> they they're going to get bigger in this, aren't they? Right. They'll and be they'll going eat back. eat my face next time. <laughs> They're going back to our research program. And I remember won't you when you were just anymore. this little. And he didn't do that? No. He was nice. You were nice. You were here. Remember? She says if I was here, he said. I held you and I rocked you, remember? You hear uh, that? Can you hear him? Yes. What does that mean? It's more or less a growl. <laughs> <laughs> they okay. chirp when they're kind of happy. They make all different vocalizations. Okay. So we hope we'll have more baby cheetahs in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, would I be great in the jungle? Here's a mosquito. Where? <laughs> okay, let's... <laughs> easy, easy. Ooh. Is that weird? <laughs> oh, I remember when I used to... Just hold it. That'd be happy to do. I remember when we had the cheat on and we were holding it like a little baby. What the hell is this? That's a black wood. Is that a spider? This is a poison arrow frog from South America. Get it. Now let's get a close up of this from this camera over here. You, you, you can hold him. They say a that the poison poisoned arrow frog. They say that the poison is, is very, very poisonous, very toxic. One of the most poisonous secretions. And uh, they're from South America. And you've heard of the Indians using poison darts they that they blow through a gun. Yeah. These frogs are put on a stick over a fire. And when they become excited, you notice how moist the skin is right now. Right. They're secreting this poison. And it drips out and is collected and mm. used on arrows. Wow. And the arrows paralyze the, the small mammals that they use. Are they harmless to humans? Obviously, they, I mean, they wouldn't bite you, would they? They are supposedly not too terribly harmless, I mean, harmful, but they will, if they get in your bloodstream, make you sick. Well, I'm not it, gonna let them in there. <laughs> the, the poison on, on your poison. hands can be washed Kiss you off. and you're a dead prince with yeah. this one. <laughs> but the poison but you, in, this comes off his body? <laughs> right. It's not in his mouth. No, right? it's secreted, it's uh, under the skin. And if you were to eat the frog or if you had a scratch and it got uh, into the mucous mm. membrane or the blood, it would make you ill. Mm. Okay, that's fascinating. How much bigger do they get than that? 
Well, they're about two inches, and the smallest are one half inch. They're hmm. very, very mem small members. Never heard of them before. No. Okay. I'm going to take him out and let I'll him... Uh... Mad. Yeah. Is that it? Is that all of them? Is that, it. Is that all the animals? Yeah. Oh, I thought she was going to go back and get something else. She was, she's going to check right now. All righty. Yeah. She's quite the cheetah's done. Well, let's thank Miss Joan Emery. Take a bow, Joanie. Thank you very much for coming in again. In the San Diego Zoo. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. What's great about her? It's Can you so see obvious. us on a safari together? Oh, no way. If you leaped in my arms, I'd have been gone. I'd That's have been a right. mile down the road. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I like about her? She really, you can tell that she really loves her work. You know, she yes, she really, does. She's good at that. She really loves that. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's always a great spot with her. We'll uh, take a break here, and we'll be right back uh, with Lawrence Welk after this word. <laughs> Lawrence Welk has been with us on the show several times before. He's a fascinating gentleman and probably one of the most popular musical personalities in the entire world. <laughs> Lawrence Welk. <laughs> no, I was just going to say I've enjoyed it. <laughs> I thought it went well, didn't you? Yeah, sit down. How are you, Pete? Thank you all very much. I'm fine, John. How are you? Good to see you. You just coming from the set, I assume. Yeah, we're shooting now. We're doing a show, and uh, we're right in the middle of it. They're all waiting for me. Yeah? They're all waiting for me. I'll tell you why I wanted to come by. Yeah. And thank you very much for allowing me. Your reception was so gracious that we had a little gag, but uh, we can't do it at any rate. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, the reason I wanted to come by is because we've done 24 of these Columbos, or 25 of them, and I think the one that's coming up has got the best clue ever. Now, just listen to this. There's a fellow who runs a health club. Now, everybody goes home, he goes in his office, and he's doing some work. The next morning they come in, they find him dead. Right? Now, he's not in his business clothes, he's not naked, he's wearing his gym clothes. Sweatsuit, sweatpants, sneakers, and socks. He was working out on, a, on an exercise uh, bench. Oh! Man, <laughs> oh, you, you dog, you. He's got a health bar, uh, uh, a barbell. Uh -huh. A barbell like this. And the barbell, he must have uh, momentarily blacked out blacked or something. Out and, the... and it came down, hit him here. Suffocated, that's what they say. <laughs> Guy suffocated. Well, we know better, don't we? Oh, certainly. He didn't suffocate. Well, I want to tell you, you know, <laughs> Columbo comes in there and he looks at the guy, he goes to his locker, he sees his business clothes, his shirt, his socks, right. his shoes, and his tie. Finished, that's it. That's all. It's all over. He don't know who did it. But, but just from you, those clues. Just from those clues, John, I'll tell you what yeah. he knows. He knows the guy wasn't working out. And he knows the guy didn't change his clothes, that somebody else did it. And I want uh, to tell you, I tell you, you know why it's a good clue? You find a poison frog in his jock, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't used that plot yet, have you? Hmm? It'd be a hell of a plot. Well, anyway. Well, would, you, would, you, uh, would you say that? Or you might have missed the lady who was here, and it probably makes no sense to you at all what we're talking about. I didn't quite follow. No. Poison something in his jock. Good. Got it. Ah, this is not important. No, no. i tell you what makes it such a delightful clue for me and why I think it'll be a delightful clue for everybody else is because it's something everybody does. You do it. You do it. And John does it. You do it. You do it. Everybody does it. Old people and young people and people in love and people that are not in love and teenagers and if you're grouchy, you do it and if you're happy, you do it. It doesn't make any difference. Everybody does it. And not only does everybody do it, everybody does it every day. Hmm? Sweat? No, nothing to do with sweat because you see he come in the, the next morning. Oh, he's dead already. The guy's already dead. But it's something you do every day. Yeah, it's something you do every day. 
Well, you couldn't tell anything from that, could you? Yeah. Brush your teeth. Well, well, you got a dead body, would you? Did you go to the bathroom? With it? <laughs> what you Dumb question to ask the corpse anyway. I mean, um, did you go to the bathroom? No. no. It's all right. You know, John, may I say one other thing? Yeah. Because it's, it's such a wonderful call. I think this is, uh, I've only talked really about two shows out of the 25 or 26 that we've done. That's right. And uh, I want to add a third one, this one, the one that's coming on uh, this. Uh, when is the premiere? The no, you day after tomorrow. Sunday. The day after tomorrow, Sunday. The day after tomorrow, yes. I think this is among the one, two, or three best Colombos ever. And uh, if you like Colombo, I wish you would do me a favor if you would include in your prayers uh, the name Peter Fisher. He, he's the guy that's doing most of the writing for us now, Peter Fisher. You got yourself a good, uh, good writer, huh? Oh, he's a mountain. You know, you're super in that show. You know that. Thank you. You really much. are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you for letting me do this. Hey, thanks for coming on. It's always a great kick for our audience, not only here, but at home, when somebody walks in that is not scheduled for the show. Thank you. And I hope you have a smashing season. It goes on as long as you want to do it. Okay, here we are. That's a surprise, isn't it? Yeah, great. We got to get him a new raincoat. That thing is getting gamey. It's getting gamey. It is seedy. Hmm. Luckily, the bad cigar covers it up. <laughs> so don't notice. <laughs> He's one hell of an actor, though, you know? Oh, He's one hell of an actor, and he does that show yeah. just right. Like. Why don't we get this commercial out of the way, and then Lawrence Welk will be with us, okay? We'll be right back. Stay here. <laughs> Lawrence Welk's first book was called uh, Wonderful, Wonderful, which was an autobiography. It was on the bestseller list for many weeks. He has another book called, believe it or not, A One, A Two, which is... It says, Life with My Musical Family. Would you welcome a very charming gentleman, Mr. Lawrence Welk. Thank you very much. I think these guys are auditioning, just in case uh, things fall no, apart no, here. They're ready to... My, my theme, they, Bubbles in the they Wine. They got the theme down? How did that start? One, one of the things that you have never taught Doc how to do is the opening like this. <laughs> I'm going to teach it to him before I leave today. When did you first do the Champagne Bubbles? Oh, it started at uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I don't know that we talked about that on the show. <laughs> did somebody come up with it or...? No. Um, uh, I had a style, and we had a very small band. I couldn't afford to hire an arranger. I used to buy stocks and, and tear them up, you know, and uh, work them up with the little band I had. And uh, when we first played Coast to Coast, a great many people wrote us letters and said that our music was different. They said it reminded them of champagne. And when so many letters came in along that line, we called it the champagne, champagne music of Lawrence music. Welk. And it stuck. Boy, has it ever. How many years all together have you been on television? I remember when you first went on television, I was working out here in the early 50s, and you started from the, one we of the ballrooms, started, I think, uh, locally. We started in 51 at KTLA for four years. Yeah. And uh, on July 2nd, 1955, we went coast to coast. We've been on television ever since. That's a long run. This is our 20th year. 20 years. Well, you're right up with Gunsmith. Johnny, you and, you and I have a lot in common. We started locally out here on the television on the West Coast. In spite of the fact we're so different, you know, I've been sitting back there watching your show, and it's so ad lib that I'm beginning to think I'm doing wrong by rehearsing all week long. <laughs> Just come out I and think maybe let it I go. I should do what you're doing. No. Everything ad lib. I couldn't do what you do. You've been too successful at it. But you were with 17 years with ABC, and then. Uh, did you leave, or did they say, hey, you're not going to be on the network anymore? No, we didn't leave. Uh, we uh, were requested to leave. Requested to leave. I've right. been through that. Everybody has who's had television <laughs> shows. How did you take it? Was it a it was personal a, affront? It was a, a very difficult thing. This is one of the reasons I think I wanted to write the book. I wanted to tell the folks a little bit what goes on in Bag of the Scene. And uh, this particular thing was a very difficult situation for me because I have altogether about 200 people. I have uh, 46 people in the orchestra, and it looked like everyone would be out of a job. And uh, it only lasted a few hours when my sponsor, Maddie Rosenhaus, with the J.B. Williams, called me and said, Lawrence, 
We still believe in you, and if you'd like to go some other route, uh, we'd be very happy to sponsor you. Well, that's a pretty good feeling when you have a sponsor and also an orchestra. All we needed is uh, some television station to carry us. Don Featherson, man that you know very Our well, friend. sent out a whole bunch of wires, and by the next morning, we had uh, a syndicated show. And you're seen now, I understand, on more stations than you were when you were actually on the we network anyway. We have a little over 250 stations this year. That's incredible. That is absolutely incredible. Well, how many people would you reach every week with that? Uh, have you made an say, estimate? I would say we reach approximately around 30 million people. Oh, that's just incredible. Who's been the most um, influential person in your life? Uh, we talked about your beginning uh, back in the Midwest and, uh, and your folks briefly, but I don't think we've talked about who really has exerted the most well, influence in your sure career. Well, I'm not sure if you could put it down to one person, because what we have is a musical family, and we have a great many people great many musicians and singers and right-handed people that have been with us 15, 20, 25 years and even more. And it's uh, the strength of the musical family, I think, that has kept us going all right. those years. Now, when you have that many people working for you, you have to be uh, pretty much of a strong, strong leader. And uh, I think we had the young dance team were on here before. Uh, right, Sis and Bobby. You said you, uh, you got, got a pretty firm hand on the, on the whole group. Uh, I uh, am known to be a sort of a slave driver, I yeah. guess, but really that's not the case because if that would be the case, my people would have never stayed with me. Right. And we have a, an extremely um, wonderful association with our people. I am, in reality, their father and they're my children, and it operates very much like okay. that. What happens if they come in late? Do you uh, say uh, no more of this? Uh, uh, we say no. Musicians, you know, sometimes, we say, or we individuals. Say no, no more. Of this. No more. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not just that way, because basically we try to make them understand if you start the show at 8 o'clock, you can't really hold it for one person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we point this out to them in a re very reasonable way. And in most cases, we can train most of them. <laughs> you, uh, now, your, your music has survived a lot of transitions because musical fads kind of come and go. Uh, I know when the rock came in, they thought it was just going to be a, a passing thing, and it, it's, it stayed very popular. But your orchestra has transcended all of that mm -hmm. through the years. You haven't really changed your style particularly, have you? No, we really haven't. However, we updated it every mm -hmm. year. For instance, uh, today we play more big band music than we've ever played. We still play a touch of champagne music. And of course, we have a, a great <coughs> many vocalists in the orchestra. But I think today, if I may brag a little bit on my musical family, I think today, our musicians, our orchestra, I think it works at a, a higher degree or at a higher level of perfection than any time in my lifetime. We, we, taped, uh, <laughs> Don't get shame. we taped the show last night and we paid tribute to Duke Ellington. And I would say that's possible one of the best shows of my lifetime. I remember at one time when George Cates was conducting the orchestra there, I stood on the sidelines and I had goose pimples all the way from my toes to my head. It was so thrilling to see that because the band really operates right. tremendously have, this, have your sponsors ever come to you and say, hey, uh, Lawrence, we want you to try a different musical thing, or we want you to play certain selections? Do you not, ever get any pressure to do certain not things? Not really, not really. I think this is possibly one of the highlights of our orchestra. We never had any interference with our sponsor. Our sponsor has been very wonderful. They believed in us. They don't tell us to do this or that. And that's, that's a security that's a great help for an orchestra leader or someone that has to show. Yeah. You've been kidded uh, in your career by some of the so-called uh, musical sophisticates who said, well, it's, it's kind of it's corny and so forth and oh, so on. But, uh, Johnny, you know no one ever called me corny. No. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know this. Look at that doc laugh. Yeah, look at him laughing <laughs> over there. He's been, only been going at it 20, Say, 30, 40 way, years. I had him on my show. And it's okay. about time we bring him on again. This guy is wonderful. What did comments? he dance with Sissy or did he play? No, uh, no, he, oh. he claimed he had a bad foot. Yes, but next was. time, next time he comes on, I'm going to have him dance with Sissy. David Brenner is with us tonight. He's just completed a three-month tour with Tom Jones, uh, which has got to be kind of a hectic schedule. And after a few days home, he'll be starring a series of college concerts. Would you welcome uh, the rather warped David Brenner? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just finished um, 
in Las Vegas. And, you know, Vegas is crazy. They bet on anything there. Anything. You know when Evil Knievel did his little trick? Do you know they were betting if he would make it? If he wouldn't make it, when he got out of the capsule, if he would wave with his left hand, he would wave with his right hand. If he's wearing underwear, what color it was. I'll tell you one thing about Evil Knievel. I'm glad he made it. I'm very glad he's okay and everything like that. But let me tell you my opinion, okay? To me, Evil Knievel proved that anything that goes up will come down. <laughs> and for proving this, he was given $6 million and is called a brave man and a hero. Now, let me tell you, folks, I am not a brave man and I am not a hero. But for $6 million, I would have jumped off that canyon with a firecracker in my nose. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's nice to be in California, friendly California. Have a nice day. <laughs> they always say that out here. That's the big expression out here. Every store you leave in Los Angeles, when you're leaving, they always say to you, have a nice day. And I don't think they listen. I'm going to have my heart taken out. Oh, have a nice day. <laughs> That's one thing about New Yorkers. They say New Yorkers are rough and, oh, you're New Yorkers? Yeah, they are, they're rough, they're tough, and, but they're not unfriendly. New Yorkers are just honest. If they don't want you to have a nice day, they don't tell you to have a nice day. <laughs> Do you ever go in a store in New York, you buy some chewing gum, the owner comes out, that's all you want, chewing gum? You bother me for a nickel? What are you, crazy? You ever come back here again, we'll kill you. <laughs> Just to make sure we're gonna kill you now. Kill that man. <laughs> New York is rough. Out here, it's very easy, very easy going, nice, it's relaxed, slow, except one place I can't take the slowness, in restaurants. You wait four years for your food, two more years for the check to come, you ever eat in New York City? It's fast. You get your meat, your potatoes, your checks in your potatoes, boom, and you're out. <laughs> and you know why it takes so long? They make everything very pretty out here. They put fruit on everything. I had a hamburger today with orange slices on it and grapes in the potatoes, raisins in the carrots. Whenever I eat in Los Angeles, I always think that on the way out of the kitchen, someone dumped garbage on my order. <laughs> And then, and then they give you parsley. I hate that crap. That, that, that is... That is an ugly food. Even when people eat it. Do you ever notice it hangs when they eat it? And you know what I really hate? When they give you those little round tomatoes that you can't eat because when you cut them, they squirt. And you ever see people try to be real cool? They put them in their mouth hole, bite down, juice shoots out their ears. And let me ask you a question. I don't know what this is because I'm from New York. What is a New York steak? What is that, a piece of meat with soot and dirt all over? What is that? <laughs> right, and written on the side, call Mary, 711. <laughs> right, I don't know what that, by the way, the girls in California are very pretty. I want to tell you something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are. The girls in New York are very pretty too. They're just dirty. <laughs> yeah, you have to wash them. It's true. If you have a blind date in New York City, it's like developing a film. You keep dipping her in water. Oh, hey, you're, oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> I had a date, I had a date in the valley. I went out to the, uh, are you from the valley? That's a strange place, the valley. <laughs> I had, that is one strange place. I always thought, you know, when you hear it, the valley. I thought rolling green hills. <laughs> Right, a nice stream up the middle with children fishing. Did you ever see the valley? It looks like the green giant hemorrhage there. That's the valley. <laughs> right, if, if it's 60 degrees in LA, it's 290 in the valley. <laughs> the valley, it's weird. It reminds me, of, like the people who live in the valley, it reminds me of, like, no one would say anything there if someone came in and took away their Clorox. Did you ever see that commercial? Where do they find towns like that? Hi, we're gonna take your Clorox and your children. Okay, go ahead. It's all right, go ahead. I'd like to see them try that in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Wouldn't that make a great commercial? Hi, we went into Brooklyn, New York and we took their Clorox. They took three of our trucks, our vice president and my left leg. <laughs> anyway. 
Yeah, it's tough there, but it's tough here. Do you know I was arrested in Los Angeles? I was arrested two weeks ago. You know what for? You ready? Jaywalking. <laughs> Can you believe that? Jaywalking? Murderers and rapists walking around free and people get arrested for jaywalking? Our only hope is that the murderers get caught jaywalking. <laughs> and before or after the crime wouldn't make a difference, right? Look, he's stabbing that guy. Yeah, I think he's going to jaywalk. Wait a minute, Bob. Wait. <laughs> See, he's got his foot up. Look, his foot's up. He's going to... I couldn't believe it. I didn't know it was a crime because it was three o'clock in the morning. No cars are coming. The light's red. I'm really going to stand there. In New York, you get in trouble for standing there. <laughs> right? A cop said, hey, what are you standing there so long? You can really say to the policeman, well, the light's red. I'll give you a red lip. Get across the street. <laughs> it's no crime in New York. Do you ever cross the street in New York City? You wait between parked cars. Old ladies, old men. Everyone's waiting. Boom! You shoot out. You run. Pass buses. Come. You run. You jump on the curb. The cop runs over. He grabs a holding and shakes your hand. How'd you do that? It was great. <laughs> And I'll tell you something I learned. You know, the police out here look tough. You see them with those boots on that look like leather leotards, and, <laughs> right? And two Magnum guns, a Billy Club, and a K-9 dog, and a bazooka, everything else. And meanwhile, the cops, you ever see the cops in New York, the belly's hanging over the belt. <laughs> they have sneakers, a beard, they spit. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, out here, they look tough, but they're pussycats. Like, I couldn't believe what happened with the SLA raid. I was back in New York and read about it. I couldn't believe it. Do you know it took 363 law enforcement officers with bazookas and tanks, right, hours to get four people out of a wooden house? Why didn't they just wait for a cop to come in from Brooklyn? Boop, boop, get your butts out of that house. Let's move it, all right? Thank you. That's funny. Thank you. Funny stuff. Thank He's you. so true. I can, can you see him taking the Clorox away in Brooklyn? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to what? <laughs> we'll take a short pause. We'll be right back after this brief intermission. <laughs> We're sitting here discussing our... Uh... So since I took that fall almost a couple of months ago, uh, everyone I've talked to seems to have either gone through something similar to that, or they say, well, I've had that before, or my back is this, or my arm. You too? Did... I had it really bad. And you I... mean from a fall or what? From something, from falling into something very dumb. A friend of mine, uh, Rick Bernstein, who was my first agent, he's yeah. one of these do-it-yourself guys. You know, he wanted to move, so he wanted to do it himself. I don't do anything myself. You know, if a chair breaks, I call a chairperson in. Well, what, there are you know, people I, who do that work, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I think mothers train, you know, mothers want you to use your mind. My mother would always say to me things like, hammer bad, bad hammer, book good, good book. So you grow up like me, banging nails on the wall with a book. I can't, you know, <laughs> nothing, I mean that, nothing. So he calls me out to move him, right? He wants me to move, and I hate the lift. I used to lift as a kid, I used to carry groceries. And, yeah. You know, women always make you take it up to the end of, the, of their house and put it in the kitchen on the table, and then they give you like three raisins as a tip. You know? <laughs> so I have a thing about carrying. So anyway, we're moving him, and some Chinese antique something starts to slip, and his wife screams. Now, normally I would let it fall, you know what I mean? Call an antique person. But I, <laughs> I went for it and pinched a sciatic nerve in my back. Mm. And I was crippled for about four to six weeks, I, like doing a great Quasimodo impression. You know, I yeah. bent over, you know, oh, she gave me water. That's about, I was really like this. They put me on the stage, then they would turn the lights on. And I heard about this doctor. And the doctor does a strange thing. He takes wires in New York, four wires. He puts cotton on the end, dips them in a solution, and he puts them in your nose. And it, anest it sounds strange, I know, it anesthetizes or deadens the nerve box, and the right. back relaxes. So when I heard about this, I said, what are you kidding? You know, with my nose, he's going to use hangers, you know? That's right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long journey, right? yeah, my, even, even. This thing, you Turn know. left at Barstow in there. Right. 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 Well, it's been, it's been broken in three places. Yeah. South Philadelphia, New York, and then <laughs> Never mind that. <laughs> Don't set me up for those. <laughs> Ring of one, two, three, four. But anyway, <laughs> instead of going, what I did, you know Steve Landisberg, my yeah. comedian friend, well, he has a bad back. Well, I would trust Steve if he told me to go anyplace. Right? He's... No, Steve didn't know. I said to Steve, I figured, no, because he would come over. His exercise was he would hang from a rod on the shower, 
It was like having a bat as a friend. He would just <laughs> hang in your bathroom, you know, really. And you'd go in there and he'd be hanging. So I sent him. I figured if he made it, I would be all right. So Steve came back and said it helped him. So I went over. You mean and, the doctor with the Yeah, pet. with this. So I said, really, Steve? And I, he said, no, really, go over. And I go over, and I'm not too big on doctors because they've changed a lot. Remember, doctors used to be great house calls in the middle of the night in the pouring rain. Well, they, they look like doctors. They right, have and spectacles they on the bag and all of that. They don't right. do that anymore. Official. Now, the doctor make a house call. You have to have an attack in his house, right? <laughs> and they'll say to you, can you move your arm? Can you put your hand in your pocket? Do you have money in that pocket? <laughs> <laughs> Remove your wallet. Right. Yes. <laughs> Well, I went, I went to this doctor, and he's a great doctor, Park Avenue, and like a Monty Woolley type. And I sat down, and he <coughs> took the wires, and he put them in my nose, and it doesn't hurt at all. And you sit there, and he talks to you, and he's a great conversationalist, and then he removes the wires, and he gives you a piece of candy to suck on. And after a few treatments, my back's relaxed. And when I heard of it first, I said, yeah. it can't be, but let me tell you, I have so much faith in him that now I would let him put candy up my nose and suck wires. And he's, uh, he's that good. He's that mm. good. Boy, you trust him then, absolutely. Oh, do I ever. <laughs> Just don't sneeze when I was up there. You'll scurry him right to the wall. <laughs> uh, that's a bad move. Uh, we'll take a short break, and we're coming right back with Ashley Montague. <laughs> my next guest has been with us quite frequently. He's a remarkable gentleman. He's a leading anthropologist and the author of over 35 books on related subjects. And his latest book is called Frontiers of Anthropology, which is a survey of 200 years of research on the nature and accomplishments of man. He's fascinating. Would you welcome Ashley Montague? <laughs> I haven't plugged through this book yet, but I'm going to, because it sounds fascinating. Have we made any great strides in 200 years, or are we... Head in bad directions. Oh, well, we You seem to be a little pessimistic many times on... Well, the only philosophically tenable position for a pessimist like myself, as I think I've explained to you before, is optimism. Right. Now, you say in this book there's one subject I want to get into, and that's something, you, there's something about you explaining you're talking about what is known as voodoo death. Yes, uh, yes, that's fascinating. In which people die from yeah. no uh, physical or uh, problems or ailments. Yes, yes. Uh, it occurs in many different uh, so-called primitive societies where a man breaks a taboo, for example, eats off a plate which only the chief is allowed to eat off. And is it, are you talking about like Tahiti and, and countries? Uh... Yes, uh, Australian Aborigines throughout a great part of Africa, New Guinea and so forth. And it automatically follows that if you break this kind of taboo, you will die. And since everyone believes this, a man has been known to lie down and die within three days from nothing else but his belief in the fact that he is going to die. And most people who hear about this for the first time simply won't believe it. Well, it's hard to believe because what, what ceases to function? You mean just yes. the breathing and everything? Or but what? now we, we understand uh, the physiology of this and how it works. I mean, what happens is the man believes in his upper story and it goes down into the brain, in the middle of his brain, at the end of which there is this pea-like body called the pituitary gland, which secretes hormones, which immediately act upon the gland situated on top of the kidneys, the adrenal glands, to secrete a great deal of cortisone. Mm -hmm. And this starts up a reaction in which the circulation is slowed down. So the two things happen. One, the oxygen that's carried on the red blood cells is reduced, so he doesn't get enough oxygen. And two, the red blood cells begin to stick, to agglutinate together. And the result of all this is that he actually drowns in his own fluids because his membranes become permeable and the circulation slows down to the point where he doesn't get enough oxygen and he dies literally of shock. So physical impairments take place, but all because of the, of yes, the mental attitude. Yes. And the only person who can cure him is the kind of person who he believes has the formula which can do the trick. No one else can do this. No one can prescribe drugs. The most effective authorities in this subject are being absolutely stymied, but in comes this medicine man, and he goes through his abracadabra, and up gets this man who is absolutely moribund and walks right out. Because he's removed the fear. Absolutely, yes. Have there been known cases of people who have died of outright fear? Not oh, this, yes, uh, not only in so-called primitive cultures, but in our own society with lots of cases on record. In other words, something is so shocking to the system that yes, nothing physical and happens. shocking is the word. Right. Because 
The physiology of this is akin to the shock that a person experiences after massive burns and also by being struck by a bullet. Right. Is this, when you're talking about the voodoo, is that the same thing that happens when they say they put a hex in some of these societies yes. where they, with the doll with the fear that he can actually accomplish this? Yes, it's identically the same sort and of thing. And says in five days or six days you will... Mm -hmm. And it's just firmly yeah. the belief in that. Yes. All this proves that... Is the modern unreal... medicine, is modern medicine able to take advantage of some of these... Uh... Well, modern medicine is very slow. You and turn it around, around, you know. You can send a message around the world now in about one-seventh of a second. It takes about 50 years to get a message into the average medical mind. It's a very conservative <laughs> instrument, so... Yeah. What do you think of, uh, now, acupuncture, as we've, we've discussed on the show with other people, and, and many doctors over here have been reluctant to accept it. I don't know why. They've well, been, they've that's been using fascinating. It, and they've been using it in the Orient for 4,000, yes. 5,000 years. Now, that's a very exciting subject. You see, one of the things that's been generally overlooked is this, is that the areas in which acupuncture is practiced are culturally very different from our own. So that what, for example, these people may believe it may be very difficult for us to believe. So that when you stick needles into ourselves, they may in fact hurt. Whereas in another culture where you firmly believe in this method, they won't hurt and they will do the trick. But clearly there is something there, but none of us knows anything about it. Yeah, it is very strange. I, I, I've seen them do it and no. uh, there is no blood no. and uh, no. whatsoever, which is... It's strange to understand that you can put a needle in somebody yes. without having, even if you prick yourself with a pin, you have blood. But when they put these needles in, there's absolutely no blood yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. And they remove them, and there's no uh, uh, evidence that they've even been in the body. So there has to yes. be something to it. Well, of course, you can control the flow of your blood if you've learned how to do this. And, of course, Eastern uh, yogis and others can do this and have been buried, for example, alive. They can change or, their rate of breathing. Exactly. Uh, and anyone can learn to do this who practice it long enough. You can reduce your blood pressure. Not everyone, let me withdraw that. There are some people who are in very seriously bad states, can't do this. But most people could. And most people could do what we call meditation. Actually, what it is, is relaxation. And you can, um, for example, cut down on the rate of living, which kills more people than any other disorder in America mm. by simply doing very simple exercises, by sitting down or even when you're walking down the street saying to yourself, um, uh, relaxation is wonderful, it's the natural way to ease and calm. I, this organ, that organ, these parts of my body, etc., feel relaxed. It's like so auto-hypnosis then? Yes, exactly. What do you attribute the rebirth or the interest in the occult lately, uh, uh, mysticism ah, and, that, that's uh, and, very, and various very fringe phenomenon. groups? Yeah. That, that is related also, I believe, to the drug cult. The one is the resort to material devices like pills, uppers, downers, and whatnot, et cetera, and various other more vicious drugs. And the other is a resort to ideas, which both have the same function, and that is to make life less painful for you, to make reality, which you are unable to face, less painful for you, in that you are able to retire into another world and which is completely mysterious. This is why books like uh, Castaneda's books, these things that sell in the hundreds of thousands where conversations with Indians allegedly give you insights into the way in which other kinds of minds work and which you can adapt for your own purpose, sell in such enormous quantities. But the fact is, this is a flight from reality and it is an extremely dangerous one. It prepares the soil for the kind of atmosphere that Hitler took such great advantage of in Germany, where enormous numbers of people mm -hmm. sort of re escaped from freedom. Freedom and responsibility is too much for most people to face. Most people can't accept it. And they'd rather join a group from which, in their own weakness, they can derive their strengths. And no matter how weird it may be, like Satanism or any exactly. of those uh, and cults. People talk about the credulity of earlier ages. There is no age that has been more credulous than the one in which we are now living. Yeah, I suppose when uh, anthropologists look back 200 years from now on... Um, oh, you are we're indeed doing. an optimist. 200 years. Well, I assume. Yes, I, I yes, would like yes, to think yes, that we're going to be around for 200 years, although there are a lot of people who don't well, uh, I hope you're think right. that man is going to be around for 200 years. You, did you share that uh, particular point? Well, I think it's highly improbable that people are going to be around next 200 years, unless they do something about it. 
and not one, not many are doing anything about it. Means controlling the population or distributing uh, the well, unless, material goods of the world a little more equitably. The, unless, of course, we solve the population problem, we won't solve any other problem. Some countries are against that. The, uh, Brazil, yes. for example, wants more people because they yes. say they've got a vast yes. land over there and they're all concentrated in the cities. They want more people. Yes, there are lots in of Brazil. Americans who believe that America is underpopulated. They don't realize that over 75% of Americans live in cities, in a very few cities, and that these are terribly overpopulated. And that when you exceed a certain size, it's quite impossible to manage the variables in it. It becomes unmanageable, unlivable, and ungovernable. Actually, I thank you for being with us again. I hope you join us whenever you would like to. It's always fascinating. Thank you. David, thank you, and Lawrence, thanks for being with us. Yeah. Peter Falk left me a note. He says, sometimes I leave before I make all my points. I mean, I have other things to say, but then I come back and say them. But this time I can't come back, but I want to say them. <laughs> he, says, he wants to thank Bob Conrad for a terrific performance and Bernie Kowalski, he forgot to be the director on that first episode. And what is he, is this for me? I'd like to know where Mr. Carson bought that jacket. I'd also like to know what he paid for it. I hear he has an in. <laughs> I'm humbled by that applause. 